A very warm welcome to the fourth of the five sessions this week, organized by Euromatau as the Raw Materials Dialogues, and as part of the EU's Raw Materials Week 2020, virtual version, of course. Now, today, we're shifting our focus from previous debates about raw materials supply, sustainability, due diligence, responsible sourcing, and we're moving our optic on to the key topic of circular economy, and specifically to deal with the question, looking forward with a forward-looking scope, how should Europe advance its circular economy leadership with strategic raw materials by 2030? We all know the circular economy debate has taken place over a number of years. And our purpose today is not to rehash that debate, but to really think looking forward with circular economy over the next decade and more. And to do that, we're joined by four outstanding speakers today, representing again, a full range of different perspectives on this topic. We've got Martin Stuchty, the Managing Director of System IQ, and previously also working with McKinsey and responsible for a number of key early studies on circular economy as well as a lot of important publications since then. Following Martin, we also have Mia Petra Kumpala Natri, who informed me that she's currently in her summer home in Finland, where it's already getting dark at this time of day. She's a member of the European Parliament for the S&D Group. She is a member of the E-Trade Committee and also a substitute member of the Inter-Trade Committee. Joining them also, we have Bernd Schaefer, the Managing Director of EIT Raw Materials, and also the head of the newly announced European Raw Materials Alliance. And last but not least, we also have from the European Commission, Mattia Pellegrini, who's the head of DG Environment's Waste Unit. And I also know is the former head of DG Grow's Unit for Raw Materials, Metals, Minerals, and Forest-Based Industries as well. So these four speakers will be sharing with us their insights and their thoughts on the issue of circular economy moving forward. But crucially, before we start, I wanna bring forward three important elements, I think, to frame our debate today. We know there are going to be more metals waste in 2030. We know there's going to be more global competition, and we know there's going to be a deeper circular economy. But what comes from these three points and what we need to address in our debate today are those boxes in blue. Clearly, if there's more metals waste, especially with new waste streams, such as EV batteries and solar cells, we need that new recycling capacity and processes to cope with it. Higher global competition we know is there and will be there in 2030. We've all seen recent news about China's heavy investment strategy into recycling capacity already. And there is, some argue, a tangible risk that Europe could lose its global leadership for waste streams. So our debate today needs to address how do we mitigate those risks? and turn them into opportunities. And clearly also there's gonna be a deeper circular economy. And what does that mean? By 2030, we may well be seeing changes in the way that we, we use, recycle and use our metals. And again, that's something we can focus our debate on here. So moving on now about how we're gonna do the debate. Well, for those of you that have been following us in previous days, you'll know, we're gonna have very brief opening statements following an initial question from me from each of our four speakers to get their views across. And then we'll go straight in to some questions from our audience and also, of course, counter comment from our speakers. And we'll keep that rolling as a fluid debate over about 30 or 40 minutes to see how well we can address these topics. I'll then give the floor to each of our speakers for a quick one minute closing statement to wrap up our debate and to bring forward their calls to action. So it goes without saying, everybody, in our audience, although you may be sitting in front of a computer or device, wherever you may be, you're not alone, because you're joined by 300 or more other people, and you can dialogue with our speakers and our other audience members through this function, question function that you see in the screenshot. So don't be shy with the questions. Whatever it is that you want to come across in this debate, a statement or a question for our speakers, send it in. It'll come to me and I'll do my best to raise it during the debate. Right, that's our topic, that's our plan. Now it's time to get down to business, I think. So I'd like to hand over to the first of our speakers, Martin. Good morning, Martin. Hey, David. Hello, Mia Petra, Bernd, Mattia. Not a bad group to be in the middle of. Hi. I'm pleased to hear it. 
Now to kick things off then, but for you, Martin, I've got a question for you. Now, you've obviously got a very strong background when it comes to thinking forward about circular economy. What do you think's needed in the next decade, up to 2030 at least, for Europe, if it's gonna make meaningful progress in establishing real circular production and consumption models for its strategic metals? Yeah, thanks, uh, David. Next 10 years. Um, uh, well, let, let's just do a thought experiment. Let's just assume for a moment that uh, climate change is real. Let's assume that the European Green Deal is worth the paper it's written on. Let's assume that everything that scientists like the International Resource Panel are telling us is real, that uh, resource use, metal use is in fact uh, 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 responsible for a big part of climate change and biodiversity. If all of that is true, then by 2030, the metals industry uh, will have to deliver uh, that, what it's delivered through virgin materials today, a third still by virgin materials, a third by recycled materials, and a third in ways that are entirely non-material, that are services. This is sort of not perfectly right, those numbers, but it's not as wrong as it sounds. So a third, a third, a third, David. And so for the first Third, you have a very clear business model. For the second one, you have about half a business model. And for the third one, you don't have a business model at all. So I'm, I, I, let me not talk about the first one. Who am I to, to tell you? On the second one, that's the recycling industry. And that is imperfect and incomplete. Yes, um, uh, there are many other industries that envy you for what your recycling industry is about. Uh, and yes, there are some leading companies in Europe, also probably in this audience, that actually have the technologies. But Whilst, but whilst our recycling rates are very high, um, our recovery rates are low due to contamination, due to polymetallic complexities, um, due to leakage inside, outside the, uh, the EU through very high recovery costs. So the EU states are still sort of uh, that whilst we are 88 uh, percent use of uh, we are recycling our vehicles end of a life cycle sort of we are still not recovering the value copper sort of ends up and uh, contaminant in steel and we are not really able to use those uh, um, conductive properties or take uh, all the electronics parts sort of uh, perhaps it's 15 percent that we really um, discover and this is really getting meaningful now to have that business model and to know how we organize recycling there's three three trillion worth of uh, market cap from some technology companies such as apple that actually said they won't they will not use from 2025 onwards um, any primary material in the first place and so we as europe sort of need to make sure that we have an access to that market. Um, and so the response to that needs to be products that actually make it easier to be recovered um, uh, as metals. And then later on that you uh, that you have a process where you stop uh, stop it from from leakage. Uh, sort of in and then the third third that sort of that's very hardly discussed in this context is a world where a part of your the services that your products develop and deliver today are actually delivered in non-materials in, in ways just look at the car one uh, we are in the middle of this big transformation a modern car most of its value most of its cost most of its emissions leak in the sit in the uh, in the build and not in the run phase um, very often is operated in the fleet so all the cash flows are coming in during the lifetime and not early on you need to have a metals industry that is actually able to help industry uh, to earn money from the utilization of your metals and not just by selling your metals you need to become go from a seller of metals towards a bank a banker um, of metals for that you need support through politics and the european grill is of course the big opportunity for that we can, will talk later about all the many levers that are available the most important element or the most important synthesis of that we need to uh, design all those different instruments in such a way that we actually become material stewards uh, uh, rather than um, that actually are managing the materials through the entire life cycle. We need to stop leakage out of Europe. We are still losing, for example, 50% of copper unaccounted. And we need to do, do when it comes to that material stewardship a bit in the way we are currently seeing it in China in the next five-year plan, uh, where they're setting up 
all the infrastructure actually to ensure that they are keeping good control, high utilization and maximum value out of their uh, metals, everything from cobalt to lithium. So clear, I captured your idea of third, third and third. And it's clear from what you said that you see in the primary metals, the business model clearly is there. In the recycling, you argue that we're halfway there. And when it comes to managing waste properly, the business model's not there. And you're talking about us becoming material stewards. This is a little bit like this idea you mentioned of really making sure we're managing things through the full life cycle properly. Well, thanks for that, Martin. With that in mind, I'm going to give an opportunity now to Mia Petra to also bring in some views before we move on to more debate. So Mia Petra, um, you, you're, you're an MEP from Finland, and I know you're very proud of Finland. And I know that you tell us, and we know that countries like Finland want to be at the center of new EU industrial value chains for batteries and other green technologies. Now, how do you think from your perspective, building on what we've heard from Martin, how do you think Europe can make sure that over the next decade, we do develop this capacity that Martin's talking about that we need in recycling. We become those material stewards and we keep our waste as a European resource rather than the heavy exporting to third countries that we're seeing at the moment. Thank you. I, I think COVID was a wake up call here as well as we see the international value chains are really there and then we need to look the uh, all the uh, chains which are global that can we shorten them for the environmental reasons. And, and I liked very much when I, now we talk about the uh, uh, even these metal and raw materials as a leakage. Uh, I, I still remember very easily the local discussion we had here in my home city, Vasa, when an old ship was uh, sold abroad after many decades in use or uh, too many. So it was a risk that it will be a really just like a, uh, the, the price was almost like a waste and then just get rid of it. Uh, and now the tone is that we talk about the leakages, so it is very important to get started with. And recycling indeed is very relevant question uh, in the terms of adequacy of the critical raw, raw materials. And I, I think uh, maybe the batteries being the one uh, key part here, uh, it is not near to 88% we heard from the cars, but for the lithium batteries, the recycling percent is 10%. So to secure the access to the sustainable raw materials, you really need to take quick steps in the field of the recycling and circular economy principles to take fully account. Yes, we need to support research and innovations, for example, on the battery recycling and materials. As legislator, we'd have to take uh, the responsibility to require high standards and targets on recycling. And, and one way is that you can also uh, consider targets for the use of the secondary raw materials, like the example of Apple was given here. Uh, and then uh, recyclability needed to be on board as already on the design phase. So designed to be recyclable batteries would make it much easier than that you have to crush them and still you cannot reach 100%. So kind of eco designing directive could be useful to, uh, to think here. And then also to... Uh, when it is exported to other countries, we recently had the, uh, the com uh, committee of the INTA on the report of the global recyclability aspect. So I, I like the idea of the digital data passport so you can actually follow what's happening to which part of the materials. Because uh, I believe there still might be also or should be also international um, links that you can create the, the global businesses and, and not uh, only make an EU as a separated island. Thanks very much. I mean, echoing a little bit what we heard from Martin there, the need for more intelligent product design, first of all, but also we're talking about high standards for the use of secondary raw materials as well as a means of hopefully improving these gaps that we currently see. And building on those two then, Bert, and with that in mind, I've got a question also for you. Uh, you know, investing into Europe's metal recycling industry is clearly going to be central to the success of the Raw Materials Alliance, which you're the head of. What do you think we need to achieve in the next decade to improve our supply of recycled materials for not only this Green Deal transition that we're looking at, but also the digital transition as well? And how can we mitigate this risk I highlighted that Europe actually loses its leadership, potentially, 
if it doesn't take the right action in the right time frame. So Bernd, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. I mean, first of all, uh, let me say that uh, the disruption of the worldwide supply chains by the COVID-19 pandemic has brought forward once again the European Union's reliance on third countries for raw materials. Imported critical raw materials like cobalt, lithium, uh, rare earths and others where Europe has established industrial base like, like in the aluminum, copper and nickel industry are more critical than ever in fueling a global competitive green and digital Europe. So circular economy in this context must address the business models needs. Yes, that has been said, and there are many needs to be addressed. That being said, we have to be fact-based on the supply demand scenarios first going forward. And so we should be very clear in this dialogue about what and how much is needed on a raw material supply basis. The objectives of the European uh, Green Deal are being fueled by a sustainable supply of raw materials and sustainability has come to the top of our agendas. In order to reach the objectives set by the Green Deal, raw materials are indispensable drivers for the transformation from the brown to the green economy and to drive the decarbonization process. So in this context, circular economy is central to the achievement of the goals set in the European Green Deal. Why is this? Because we know already today that there's a disparity, there's a mismatch between supply and demand going forward for many raw materials, not only critical. The circular economy, however, is not yet circular because many elements that are needed for the green transition are not yet in the cycle or not in sufficient amounts to support the transition. The tail of the circle, so the original input of the circle, needs to be fed by mining in its broadest sense, so including also urban mining and including primary sources like greenfield and brownfield considerations, as well as secondary sources, waste reprocessing. So we see the whole thing is a bit more complex than just circular economy, which of course is very important, but there are many side aspects to be considered. And circular economy is currently one of the main strategies and initiatives at European level and uh, the European Raw Materials Alliance clearly represents one of the most relevant stakeholders able to support, to boost, facilitate the adequate implementation of this uh, absolutely key strategy through specific actions on design for circularity, recycling, and also end of life products considerations. We have to look at industrial based valorization, but it addresses also the industrial symbiosis as a source of secondary raw materials. And there is a unique opportunity in Europe to build on its global leadership in sustainability and circularity as well as to use the potentials of the circular economy, which is essential to address and close gaps of raw material supply. Example, we currently have many metals with recycling rates below 1%, and many of them are what? Critical raw materials. So a lot of opportunities to improve and to focus, but we should not only focus on recovery technologies, circular economy, um, needs also to follow the imperative at comprehensively looking across all aspects of the value chain, including design, digitalization and logistics, but also legislative prerequisites and substitution of incumbent material applications must be subject of an efficient circular economy sub, uh, concept. Uh, in, in many cases, the main problem could be uh, the right and sustainable supply of waste to recycling plants. We need to improve the collections, collection schemes as, uh, for example, in the case of smartphones. So design for circularity is an essential aspect to be considered as well. The low recycling rates of some metals are linked to this. And this is very much complicated when we look at the aspect of sorting and dismantling processes. So the coming sustainable products regulation will facilitate this issue supporting eco-design and the implementation of uh, what was just mentioned, the, the digital uh, product passport. Yeah, so we need to invest. There are many needs what we need to do. We need to invest in, in innovation, but not only for recovery technologies, uh, also for sorting and dismantling technologies, as for example, digitalization and artificial intelligence applied to these technologies 
from a quantitative... Well, well, if I can come in there, Bernd, with this in mind, you touched upon the need for legislation here as well to really facilitate investment and have investment into these areas. Keeping in mind a little bit our time and thinking about moving forward with our debate, I'd like to bring in, if you agree now, Matir on this, who's going to perhaps give us some insights into what sort of legislative initiative we've got coming that can help facilitate this. And I'll bring you back in after to give your views on whether you think that they're adequate or what more could be added. So Matir, I'll move on to you now, if I can. Um, good morning to you or good afternoon. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, indeed, it's an extreme pleasure for me to, to be here because, and uh, as you have mentioned, uh, for six years of my professional life, I've been dealing with primary raw materials and now dealing with uh, secondary raw materials. So this is really an issue close to my heart. Um, and I've devoted actually almost my entire professional career as head of unit over the last period uh, in this field. And uh, mm, Indeed, I don't want to scare everybody, but what is coming uh, in terms of legislation is what I could call a tsunami of legislation. Um, that's the reason why- If I can just ask you a question, Matteo, if I can. Yeah. Talking about the tsunami, not wanting to interrupt. So tell us about the tsunami very briefly. Yes. So more the, importantly, the... I also want to know within this tsunami that's coming that you're going to tell us about, what do you see as maybe being the key success factors in really dealing with the issues that our other speakers have brought up about the need for better recovery technology, but not only and in all aspects of the value chain. So with that in mind, give us your tsunami quickly, but tell indeed. us what you see also as the key success factors. Yeah, I will be very fast. And uh, indeed it was my intention to explain how these uh, legislative changes, uh, they will tackle all the issues that uh, were been mentioned by the honorable member of parliament, also by the other two speakers. So let me start with the batteries. There was lots of reference to batteries. Uh, on the 8th of December, now is in the agenda of the commission, the European Commission will adopt the new batteries regulation. Uh, so the first change is already legal change. We're moving from a directive, a very old directive into a regulation. It's a big change because that means that the rules which are going to be set up in this regulation will be applicable in the same way in all member states. The second big change is exactly what you say, that you, need, you expect to have a life cycle approach uh, to circular economy. Indeed, in this batteries proposal, we are covering all the steps of the uh, life cycle of a battery. Uh, so essentially we are um, from mining all the way down to recycling and second use, because as you know, for batteries, you can also have a second use. So uh, uh, we start with extractions of the raw materials which do they go on a battery, so notably cobalt and lithium, but also the raw materials, and they will be due diligence requirements, mandatory due diligence requirements in terms of respecting the OECD guidelines on the supply chain. Then there will be very strict conditions for placing uh, electric vehicles batteries and industrial batteries into the European uh, market. I will mention three set of measures. First of all, there will be a carbon footprint. It will be introduced step by step. So there will be first an obligation to label the carbon footprint of a battery. The second step will be to establish a carbon footprint performance classes. And the third step will be a threshold uh, that needs to be respected. So all the batteries which will go beyond that threshold in terms of carbon footprint can, will not be able anymore to be sold in the European market. First element in terms of placing to the market. Second element, placing to the market, the mandatory recycled content. A lot of discussion was taking place by previous speakers saying there is not enough recycled content in the new products. And it is correct. Therefore, in this new battery proposal, there will be also provisions under which a percentage of the cobalt, for example, of the lithium, which comes, uh, which is in a battery, do not only come from primary sources like uh, Congo or um, Chile, but will come also from recycling of the old batteries. Uh, of course, this will take time. That's the reason why we have foreseen the first uh, enabling obligation. So to already indicate how much of the um, uh, content that comes from secondary raw materials. And then as uh, from 2030, when there will be sufficient batteries coming to the end of their life, they will be 2030 and 2035, two, two sets of targets for mandatory recycled content. 
third obligation, we are going to regulate the performance of the batteries in order to phase out all the non-performing ones. And of course, there will be also rules in terms of recycling and recovery of batteries and also new targets in terms of recycling efficiency and recovery efficiencies of the batteries per each of the critical raw materials. There will be targets for 2025 and targets for 2030. I can tell you that they're rather, again, a very ambitious target. And also, we will establish rules under which you can repurpose a battery at the end of its life. So as you know, electric vehicles batteries can be dismantled and the cells which are contained in the battery can be used for energy storage. At the moment, there are no rules and there is a total of clarity of what is the nature, whether, for example, that product is waste or not waste. So there will be specific articles to explain if under certain conditions are met, that product at the end of its life is no longer waste, but it becomes another product for energy storage. So we will facilitate also this transition to second life. Uh, and also very importantly, it was mentioned by the member of, of parliament, uh, they will be for the first time ever, and they, this is a sort of prototype for all the product legislation, um, two specific articles, one on the battery's passport, digital passport. So every battery which is placed in the European market will have to be accompanied by digital passport for batteries. This digital passport will contain all the information I've just been describing to you, both the, the static information and the dynamic information. So, um, and as you know, when I'm talking about dynamic, this will be per each model of batteries and per each type of battery will be different because even if you have the same model of batteries, then it depends on how you use the battery. So on, on each individual consumer. So, and this will be in a, in, in a data space system. So the idea is to collect all of data and to have different rules for accessibility to this data by, of course, automotive producers, but also about uh, the large customer category, so the consumer li uh, like us. And also, of course, uh, there will be a specific access by regulators because, of course, we need this data to set up all the different targets I've mentioned, to review, actually, the targets uh, um, I've mentioned. So the batteries, I think, it, uh, is a model for all the new product legislation, which will come also with a review of the Eco Design Directive. The second point. Yeah, the second so, uh, can I, if I can come in there just for a moment, Mattia, because you've raised a lot of good points already. And I'm just thinking a little bit about time here, and also the fact that I've got 11 questions already from our audience that they're burning to ask. So, if I could ask you very briefly just to touch upon your other points. And then I'll bring in some of those questions from our audience yeah, to drive And, and we'll touch only one point and the rest can come in the discussion. Right? Since there was a lot of focus on the leakage of uh, waste, uh, uh, by spring, uh, we are coming up with a major revision of the waste shipment regulation. The only way to tackle that is the waste shipment regulation. And we are going to tackle the waste shipment regulation in two ways. So how do we reduce the leakage? If there is a leakage, there must be a reason why we have all this uh, huge export of waste, which in reality are secondary raw materials outside Europe. And by the way, as you know, on plastics, there was an import ban by, by China. So we were exporting so much to China on plastics that China decided to have an import ban. For your information, we have looked at data. This has not resulted in more recycling in Europe, essentially has resulted in an increase of recycling in Turkey. So what he was exported before to China is now going essentially to Turkey. There has been a bit of increase in Europe, but the bulk of it went to Turkey. So to do that, we need to do two things. One will be how to facilitate the trade of waste in Europe compared to the rest of the world. So we will simplify the shipment of waste as a secondary raw materials within the European Union. I'm also here referring to hazardous waste because um, lots of electricity the electronic equipment is hazardous waste, but then it's full of critical raw materials. So there, we will introduce an electronic notification system. So no more paperwork. It will be done automatically between the different member states with a, with a, a software, which we'll be announcing next year. Secondly, we will um, um, uh, uh, facilitate a new procedure, streamlined procedures, and we will reduce the cost associated to the waste shipment regulation, notably uh, there is a, um, a financial guarantee which needs to be provided every time you ship waste in Europe. This will be significantly lower. So the cost of business to, to, to transport waste in Europe uh, to different recycling facilities will be significantly lower for all these reasons. Then what do we do with the rest of the world? Uh, of course, in the Green Deal, there is a very ambitious uh, uh, 
a statement, the receiving written, the European Union will stop export of waste outside the European Union. Of course, a general ban, uh, I mean, I cannot respond for my um, political, uh, let's say, masters, but indeed the general ban as such of all waste uh, not going anymore outside Europe uh, will have some problems in terms of WTO compatibility. But what we are exploring now is that uh, is a system under which uh, we change completely the rules. So we only export uh, to countries which have notified to the European Union their intention to receive waste from the European Union and they have duly explained and convinced us that the way is going to be treated in terms of an environmental point of view, it is equal to the way it would be treated in the European Union. At the moment, they can export everywhere, as you know. So that is the problem we're facing now. So with the new system, there will be a reversal of burden of proof. In principle, we do not export unless country X uh, notify to us the reason why they want to receive waste from us and explain to us that it's treated in an environmentally sound manner. So that's our few concrete ways uh, that we believe will help to, to tackle this issue of the leakage of waste, which was mentioned uh, by the previous speakers. Thanks, Mattia. Th thanks for outlining that tsunami that you mentioned, the legislative action from, from the Commission's side and highlighting a number of, of key priorities there for us. I want to bring in now very quickly, if I can, with some short uh, reactions to that. First Martin, then Mia Petra, then Bernd, and then I must insist that I'm going to bring in four or five questions from our audience. So Martin, over to you, please. What's your reaction to what you've heard so far, particularly from Mattia in terms of legislative initiative and the trend of that in response to the problems you highlighted? Uh, thanks, David. Let, let me uh, respond immediately to Mattia uh, and uh, to the tsunami. Um, look, there is a sort of uh, uh, the, 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 there's one way to read this as this enormous thrust of new regulations, uh, and that might not sound upbeat to everyone who listens to that from industry. I think the European Commission really deserves to be commended for this because what they have in fact created is a future growth industry. Um, if you look into the full cycle of a battery, uh, everything from uh, the production, the first use, um, uh, then uh, grid integration, um, a vehicle to grid integration, smart charging, second use, and then assorted accountable disassembly and uh, uh, reuse or recycling in industry. Um, that is a growth sector. There are sort of, we identified at least seven business models that are all localized in Europe that you actually can um, build on that. So I think uh, it not only does it serve this uh, uh, objective of being greener, not only does it serve the objective of being uh, less dependent on critical minerals, it also serves the objectives of really creating a particular information economy um, um, uh, in Europe with lots and lots of upside. I think that's another way to read the tsunami. Um, for us or for you as industry, of course, this uh, has repercussions because um, uh, going back to the third, a third, a third. So uh, yes, this will sort of moving into batteries first will create a major massive thrust for all those who actually are providing virgin material into that industry. Uh, but then very quickly, you will see that there is a second third actually taking off potentially faster than you, those who actually are working on uh, recovery of those materials, setting up the recycling sector, and we have a massive uh, gap to be filled when it comes to setting up that infrastructure. But then, most interestingly, I think we will be seeing a super growth of uh, industries, um, service industries, that will actually be managing uh, the, the, the battery inventory that we have to its best use uh, by way of uh, giving performance insurance, by way of doing the disassembly, by way of building those battery passports that uh, Mattia talked about. Um, and so I think it's it's also a very good example, an urgent example, a big example to consider what is it sort of when we sort of would are we in the business of providing virgin materials? Are we in the business of providing materials? Or are we in the including recycled ones? Or are we in the business of providing the services, the benefit? that those materials give to us. And that creates a huge market and that is growing. Only providing the virgin materials is of course something that with the vision that he gave us is uh, not going to be the growth engine forever. Okay, noted, thanks. With that in mind, Mia Petra, I'll hand over to you. What's your reaction to what you've heard from other other speakers and also from Matia about the legislative initiatives that are becoming forward? 
particularly emphasize we heard on batteries and waste shipment regulation as well. Yes, uh, uh, as my home country is eager to grow on the uh, recycling business as well, I have to admit that at the same time we are the the, the biggest source in, in Europe for many raw materials. And that will, I hope, prove for others that it is really, uh, to, to, uh, as the previous speaker said, to create new business models, to create more resilient value chains. And, and I also think that we should learn to use word high tech when we talk about the waste management and, and recyclability of the high tech uh, computers, uh, electronics, uh, batteries, namely, and, and, and as cars. Uh, and also uh, the knowledge that we had in the INTA committee also that there is a harsh competition for the global raw material basis. So this is also the strategy for the resilience that we will not be that dependent, whatever the reason is, earthquake or pandemia or, or trade wars or just that we are losing out to, to being able to pay. Uh, and, and that's why also the critical raw materials plays an important role. But as mentioned all and all on, on kind of, this is the possibility for the win, win, win. And I hope the industry will see it that way as well. Okay, noted. And Bern, over to you. What, what, do you. what do you respond to what you've heard so far? Yeah, I, I think from what I've heard here is uh, very interesting and it's good that we are addressing this from a legislative side. Uh, nevertheless, I think that uh, quantitative aspects are key here. We should be very clear that all initiatives are consistent with the needs. And I'm missing a bit the quantitative approach in all the discussions that I'm seeing, really uh, that there is consistency along the value chain from a recycling capacity standpoint, from a logistic standpoint, from a dismantling design standpoint, because what we want to have in a recycling process is certainly having highest efficiency and less waste production. The aspect of waste minimization is probably something that deserves a separate look at. And uh, I think that uh, with all this in mind, uh, certainly also the uh, aspects of uh, what do we have in the feedstock? So meaning what other products and what other backlogs do we have as recycling potential still in the pipeline that is not being touched by this um, uh, uh, legislative um, uh, measurement uh, that will still have to be considered because there are still dozens of uh, examples where we have um, in the case of battery a recycling potential in the, in the pipeline and just the look at the forward development of the e-mobility uh, might uh, not cover the full spectrum here. Okay, and I have actually a question from our audience that I want to give straight to you if I can, Bernd. And then I'll pass it to the others as well. And we talked a lot about, you know, we need to have better eco design uh, within, within products. We need better product design to facilitate better recycling. But someone has brought up, I think, what's a, maybe a crucial element we haven't touched upon yet. Um, we have materials. I mean, the way that our recycling structure at the moment, from what I understand, is more oriented towards recovering materials with the highest volumes. But there are obviously, within the value chain, within the recycling needs for critical raw materials, there are actually a certain number of, uh, of uh, metals here, critical raw materials, that we need for green and digital technologies that actually aren't being recycled at all at the moment. They are literally waste. So my question is, do you see an urgent need also to make sure within our strategy for all of this, that we don't forget about those critical raw materials that as is, and I think Martin mentioned a few of these before, the recycling rates are 1% or less. I, I would definitely say yes to keep the answer very short. I think we need to have more guidance and more regulations around this. I mean, just look at mobile phones. There are 60 elements in each of our smartphones. They are piling up and uh, they are not being recycled. The old WEE guideline is probably not fulfilling with the recycled rates that have been intended to it. And uh, definitely additional guidelines would help here, even though it might be very uh, work intensive to segregate all the elements and critical raw materials, um, rare earth elements uh, from mobile phones. But last but not least, what we are seeing is a clear gap of um, rare earth elements, for example, in the magnets and motors industry to cope with the demands as it's coming from the automotive industry going forward. So we have to really push all levers here in order to make sure that we are closing the gap towards it 
This goes from product design, this goes from reuse versus recycling, this goes also to extended life cycles, and this probably will also go back to the producers uh, that will have to take a bigger um, share of the responsibility there. Mm. And, and, and a question for all of you as well. Yeah, thanks, Bernd, for that, for your insight on that. Another question that's come through from our audience and something burning in my mind as well. We're all talking before about leakage. That currently, we don't recycle enough. Uh, I think Mattia highlighted that when China put its ban in on importing material from Europe, it simply got re-diverted to Turkey instead. It didn't stay in Europe. So it, are we always going to have a certain degree of leakage in reality over the coming years? And then on that basis, should our focus as Europe be more on controlling exports? We've heard about this idea of passporting for materials and so on. Or should we also be in parallel working with developing countries to improve standards and safeties? Standard and safety in those developing countries or in those countries that receive an amount of our waste for recycling. Is it not a little naive to expect that we can do it all at home? I don't know what you all think about that. Mia Petra, I'll bring you in first on that. Martin, if you don't mind, I'd like your views. Ben, you too, and finally we'll come to Matthias. So, Mia Petra, what do you think? Uh, in our INTA opinion and the paper on the recyclability on the international uh, trade schemes, uh, idea was that we can develop uh, international uh, value chains here as well. So not to ban everything, not to import, not to export, but remain open competitive continent. Uh, and there we really need uh, having this uh, kind of tools where the digital uh, product passport could be the one so we can follow up. And then uh, the, the commission idea was very uh, the concrete on the way that we have to have the guarantee that the, the country of destination will treat the ship, the car, the battery, you name it, uh, on the proper way. So, so that is also the way to make uh, a waste a, a product that is interesting, having the price, as you know. Uh, but I do want to emphasize also the recyclability by design, so then you can do a lot. But I'm not the one to say that we cannot uh, let the developing countries be there to use their working um, hands to, to, to do that, but then of course with the standards that we want. So yes, I very much emphasize also the life cycle that not to have the uh, the suitcases, the European companies that now exist for the some big tech because the materials they are using in African countries, uh, they are uh, carried by the unbearable working condition with the child labor. We all see the pictures of the raw material sources there. So of course, replacing them with the uh, better uh, kind of working condition from the very beginning. Is there the ILO standards in place in the very early source, but then also when recycling that they can uh, develop that one. So I do hope also other continents will develop on the recyclability and Europe can be the leader, but not the blocking the, the boundaries inside. Hmm. Thanks, Mia Petra. M Martin, what's your view on, on this issue of, is it naive to expect we can keep it all at home in the short term? And aren't we therefore obliged in line with European values in a sense to also make sure that where we're exporting it to is doing it in a way which is not damaging to either environment or, or other aspects? Um, I, I found it quite interesting what um, Mia Petra said that this, uh, it's interesting that we arrived at a concept of leakage sort of which is a step forward because we seem to have come from a world where we were happy if everything from plastic to all chips were under a rug and now sort of we consider it leakage and we start to manage it. We have domestic leakage uh, and we have international leakage. International leakage is one of the really interesting also intellectually interesting parts of the European Green Deal that they are trying to get through um, the reconciliation of principles of the circular economy and WTO and open trade. And I think particularly this element of exporting only to countries and to destinations where there's uh, uh, no uh, environmental leakage happening is in fact a uh, a, a very big step uh, in the greater scheme of things. It's uh, quite commendable. Um, I, I think the, the bigger issue is, is leakage even internally that we get, don't get our uh, materials back and we can't leave it to the metals industries or to the recyclers or to the recovery systems to get hold of that. And that's why it's very important um, to think through what is really needed in order to get uh, with heavy work from some 
uh, 10 to 14 to 18 percent recovery. Um, we, whatever numbers you look at and uh, whatever uh, instruments you think through, it's very hard to think of a world where we are really getting that up to the 70 or 80 or 90 percent that we really need. And the only way we can do that is if we, uh, if the producers help us, if they are forced to act or if they are willing to act as if they were the through cycle owners of their products so that they have an incentive uh, uh, to take it back. Once that is happening, uh, not only do you get your materials back and we have a, 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 a clear sort of a, a more honest conversation about how the circular economy might help us to, to, uh, uh, to have the materials that we need for our industry. Uh, it also takes you into a world which has lots and lots of strategic advantages for those producers because you are, uh, first of all, getting away from lots of risk. Look at the plastic bottles on the beaches, but you're also secondly uh, 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 starting to, com to change the way in which you're doing contracts and you have, you're starting to invent new contractual forms of working and uh, uh, and thriving with your customers. So that's the, the world in which we move away uh, from just selling things towards having much more longer term um, uh, performance contracts. Uh, and that goes for almost every product. Something like that needs to come in. And the Circular Economy Action Plan of Europe is in fact addressing this very difficult question head on. Without that help, we uh, it's just not realistic or uh, to discuss about... Uh, 90% uh, recovery rates for uh, for smartphones. Uh, we need to have producers uh, and we need to have operators that act differently with a different set of incentives. Thanks. Thanks very much for, for, for those points, Martin. Bernd, I, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add on this. Uh, well, I, I mentioned this uh, before, I think, indeed, that uh, this this concept of being aware about what is the leakage. I mean, we, we, we have to have this, and I'm always getting back to this quantitative assessment, and it really goes uh, in, in hand with what Martin just said. I think the C CAP is, is crucial to it, yeah, so this discussion has to be brought ahead, and it must contribute also then not only to achieving the climate uh, goals, which is clear, that's the overarching target, but also really... Mm -hmm. Uh, decoupling a bit the uh, uh, the economic growth also from the obligations and the impacts that this will have to provide on multiple levels, also including the producers, but ultimately to strengthen the competitiveness in the region, as I think that following this logic, including also an eco-design directive in this context, is at the end of the day contributive to the competitiveness of the European uh, industry. The issue here is about change. The issue is certainly about uh, understanding a different mantra, bringing this into the organizations, working on different business models that this will require. So it really goes down to the operational. But I fully agree that uh, this, this concept here needs to be considered. Okay, thanks, Bert. Noted. Mattia, a brief, brief comment from you on what we've heard so far. I was uh, not uh, the, the the audio was not activated. I think the uh, indeed. I mean, let me make a few comments. Indeed, we are fully aware that uh, uh, legislative changes are not the only uh, let's say solution to the problem. And indeed, uh, um, uh, we are also aware that all our targets uh, already of the existing legislation, half of the member states do not comply with them. That was very clear to me when I came. To, as a new head of unit to this unit. And that's the reason why in all the meetings I'm having with the member states which are lagging behind, I'm reminding them of the importance that whatever has been granted under the recovery fund, which as you know is massive amount of money, will be also used and particularly used to invest in, an infra, in a waste infrastructure, recycling capacities. Because indeed the issue of recycling capacity, which was mentioned is a, is a key issue. Sometimes there is very little recycling because there is not enough capacity. That's the reason why we are exporting, by the way. If we reinforce uh, uh, recycling capacity in Europe, then um, you will see that there will also uh, be a drop of export. So that's, uh, that's the reason why I really expect uh, member states, uh, which uh, uh, and as you know, uh, the Commission is putting that accent in, also in the context of the, circular, of the recovery plans, uh, to really keep uh, circular economy and digital economy as the key pillars of these recovery plans. Uh, on the issue of, uh, that was raised about uh, the, it always important to quantify, uh, indeed we are quantifying. So for example, 
in the context of the waste treatment regulation review, we are trying to get uh, detailed data per type of uh, waste uh, stream of what are the capacity in Europe, because indeed, uh, you know, there is no point to, by the way, as I said, uh, to have a general ban on export of waste that will be very different from a WTO of view, but may also be not very good from even uh, an environmental and an industrial point of view, because of course, uh, it is correct what the EIT uh, said, the CEO of the EIT, that you need to know what are your recycling capacities uh, to treat uh, then that waste uh, in, um, in Europe. Uh, I just wanted to also mention that uh, indeed the, the leakage was mentioned by, it depends on the waste streams. So there are some waste streams where action is really needed in addition to the waste shipment regulation. So uh, the tsunami includes many other revisions and one of them is the end of life vehicles directive. It was mentioned also by the member of parliament, uh, uh, vehicles as well. Uh, so when I came in December to the unit, I was shocked. Uh, I thought it was a, a, a mistake in a briefing. Uh, when I saw that, um, you may be aware that every year at the end of, of the year, there are 10 millions of vehicles which they come to the end of their life. So if I would ask here in the audience, uh, how many of that uh, they disappear from the market and they are not recycled, uh, most probably no one of the audience or the representative in the audience will get the right number. The number is 4 million. So out of 10 million, 4 million are unknown whereabouts they are defined. So there are 4 million of vehicles that they disappear every year on the market. So that is huge as a leakage. And there in the end of life, so we have plenty of ideas that we will explore in the end of life vehicles legislation on how to make sure that this is no longer possible. Also in terms of registration of the vehicles, uh, in terms if of- If I can ask Mattia, just to clarify, when is this uh, legislation to deal with the issue you've highlighted? When's that in the pipeline to appear? Uh, beginning of 2022. So we are already in working on the impact assessment. Yes. Okay, well, so, that, that'll be interesting to see what effect that has in dealing with that huge number of, if you give the example of vehicles that have not been dealt with. Now, one last if question. I for you. Mattia, also, if I can, Mattia, if you'll allow me, because we're running a little short on yeah. time now. And I want to give also our other speakers a chance to come in too. My apologies for interrupting. But there's one other question that we haven't addressed yet. But I think we really do need to in this debate, if we can. It's a question that's coming from quite a number of our audience members. And it's something that's come up very much also during our raw materials dialogues this week on ethical sourcing, on sustainability of supply, resilience of supply, due diligence and other areas. It's talking about consumers. We've talked a lot about market players, industry. We've talked a lot, obviously, about legislation, legislative initiatives, and, and gaps and needs that we have. But let's also not forget that it's consumers that ultimately buy products at the end of the day. And we've been talking about we need new circular service models. Okay. But do we expect, and this is a, a, maybe a yes, no, or in-between answer quickly from each of you, do we expect consumers uh, are going to need to pay extra for this? And if so, do you think they are willing to pay extra? So, so Martin, I'll give that to you first. Yeah. Any asset, any product, any material that is being used more extensively gets cheaper. So in other words, by going circular in the end, uh, it will be cheaper for the consumer and that's why they want it. Mm. Okay, so you, you see then that, that ultimately it'll drive down price and that'll drive up consumer demand. And you think people are, so you don't see that there'll be in the short term a price premium then perhaps for the more circular compliant, better recycled, less primary use materials. Because I would argue possibly in the short, I agree with you, the lo clearly in the long term, there's going to be benefits in this circular economy model being brought to fruition. But in the shorter term, Will we be asking consumers to pay a premium for this? Um, and, if, and if so, do you think they will pay? Is there a willingness in the market for people to say, yes, I, I want that product that is greener. I want that product that uses more recycled material. We we, we do know that customers, so that there's a 10% segment in Europe that would be prepared to do that, 90% aren't. Um, the, the, the concept that we are discussing here of taking uh, uh, products circular is in fact a very powerful driver of total cost of ownership. So it makes it cheaper for you to use it across a life cycle. And that is something that many consumers in fact pick up. So they would buy it. 
Okay, so you're convinced definitely yes. Bent, what, what about you? Do, you? do you think it's a big yes as well in the same way that Martin's putting forward? Consumers want this, are ready for this, and, and ultimately it'll be something they're very on board with? Well, I, I would not generally assume that uh, this wouldn't have a price effect. So indeed, on the raw materials side, we know and there's evidence that for many metals, the cost for recycled metal is much lower than for prime. So therefore, uh, it's a question of the price function here, to what extent the raw materials portion of the price is determining, which is, by the way, in many cases, uh, minor to the total price. So therefore, I would rather be in favor to say there will be a willingness to pay for a certain upcharge if it's getting more sustainable, because consumers will also understand, and I think that's the broader societal context, that there is a need for circular economy, there is a need for decarbonization, and they will also understand the context of having rather um, the circular economy as contributing to, um, uh, to, to employment and also to the competitiveness of the industry. Okay. And, and Mia Petra, from your point of view, how do you view this? I hope, I, yeah, I, I hope that we are not uh, having the too much of the transition cost because of course new investments is needed. But at the same time, when I received yesterday the 20 million young people covered study, they were very much more prepared than our generation because the knowledge and very about the climate change and sustainability and the fair transition was a key the message that was included. But I also believe that uh, after transition, this becomes the victory win-win as the materials are more effectively used. But at the time, it is too easy, too cheap to treat uh, products in the end of the lifetime as waste and, and especially exporting it with no cost actually to dump it somewhere like it was the open uh, uh, the waste collection points that where there was not any uh, costs to just get rid of something and now this is actually putting some price that if you don't uh, use it, you, it, you have at least have to be able to recycle it and then even to create business on the, the material, but then also the services around it. So the business models are very important part when we do the legislation and the, the transition. Right, noted. Now, I'm keeping an eye on the clock here, ladies and gentlemen. I think an hour to tackle a question like how can we advance circular economy leadership by 2030? It's always a big ask, of course, to debate such a huge topic in 60 minutes. I think we've raised some interesting points. I think we've had some interesting reflections from our audience too, and some good elements have come already from this discussion. But to bring things to a close, if I can now, roughly, I'd like to give a, a challenge to each of you. It's not an easy question from my side, but if um, my question is this, if you had to highlight two or three priority actions that you see as key to 2030, meaning that the circular economy has been properly advanced in Europe and Europe has maintained leadership. What would for you those one, two, three key priority things be? And I'll take the same order as we kicked off with today. So Martin first, then Mia Petra, then Bernd, and finally Mattia. So just briefly and quickly, what is your takeaway for our audience? What do you see as the crucial one, two, Great. Martin, over to you. I say with one, David. Um, um, every problem has a first best regulatory answer. Uh, for climate change, it's the carbon price. For the circular economy, I'm increasingly coming to the conviction it's producer ownership. We need to make producers want to retain ownership through the life cycle. <laughs> if we do that, then uh, consumers want it, uh, politicians want it, producer want it, and we will all be pulling uh, in the <clears throat> we'll all be pulling in the same direction. With that, we get all the recovery rates and the circular performance that we can currently only dream out. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Crystal clear. Right, Mia Petra, over to you. I would say the mindset is the first one. The terms and ideas, how we want to do, run the, the business uh, on the business side and under the governance side. Then the investments, we need it. We need it on the research and we need it really to put it in practice. And then I would say that the right way of uh, legislative uh, uh, steadiness that you know this is something worth of investing that we can set the framework and it's 
a tsunami sounds quite good to me that there is a trust that investments will not be wasted. So it's very much a positive tsunami rather than a negative one. And I think you touch upon a very interesting point. We haven't got into depth with really the third one in our time today is that need for regulatory stability over time to facilitate investment as well. So Bernd, over to you. What's your one, two, three? Um, my, my one would be clearly recycling capacities needs to grow dramatically. Uh, that is in terms of capacities and capabilities, investments in automation and dismantling and sorting are essential and needs to be compliant with the uh, eco-design uh, requirements. The legislative side certainly must be also accompanying the whole aspect. And uh, last but not least, of course, the involvement at a certain level of uh, responsiveness and responsibilities of the producers in order to um, call for solutions, uh, so-called waste materials across the full value chain uh, that needs to be considered. Okay, thank you, Claire. And finally, last but not least, Matthias, what would be your brief one, two, three, the takeaways as top priorities in terms of achieving this leadership in circular economy by 2030 for raw materials for Europe? Indeed. So I tend to, 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 to agree with previous speakers, in particular with, uh, MEP, with the MEP. So the first one, I would say, a stable and forward-looking regulatory framework. And I insist not only forward-looking, but also stable. So I think there has been many revision of the legislative system or in the field of uh, uh, circular economy. I think what we need now to have a comprehensive legislative revision and then has to be stabilized. Uh, to allow member states to implement. The second point will be indeed, I agree also, investment uh, and notably how to best use uh, the uh, recovery uh, and resilience plans in order to boost the recycling capacity in Europe. When I say recycling capacity, it's not only mechanical recycling, but also to explore new ways of recycling. As you know, there is a lot of debate at the moment around uh, chemical recycling and what are the opportunities. And finally, as a third point, consumer. I didn't reply before to the, to the, the question of consumer. Uh, we need consumer. So that's the reason why I do consider the single-use plastic uh, directive uh, from that point of view a model, because as you know, through the extended producer responsibility fees, uh, there will be consumer campaigns which will be financed. So that's, uh, I think, is a model also again for future legislation. When I say consumer, also consumer in terms of uh, knowing the rights and uh, soon, uh, they will be as part of this uh, famous tsunami I've mentioned. Also other colleagues actually, not DG Environment, but colleagues in DG Justice, which are coming up already next year with an initiative on uh, right to repair, by which so the consumers in Europe will be granted uh, the right to bring, for example, their electronic devices uh, to be repaired. As you know, this uh, right is often denied. Uh, there is often a, a push to, to buy new machines, new, uh, tablets, new mobile phone. So, of course, this is a personal choice, but uh, it will be this initiative to grant uh, uh, an additional right, a clear right uh, to have uh, a repair at an affordable price uh, for every consumer. So that's uh, um, consumer is the third dimension and is equally important as uh, the regulatory framework and the, fi and the financing. Thank you, Mattia. Well, with that then, with those conclusions in mind, I'm going to bring the debate to a close now. So a very big thank you on behalf of Eurometal to Martin, Mia Petra, Bernd, and to you, Matia, as well, for joining us today. A thank you also to our audience for your questions that came in, that you sent in for us. Now, only last point to note for me before I close my connection is you can join us tomorrow, again at one o'clock, for the last, the fifth in a series of five of these raw material dialogues this week, where we're looking and moving our spectrum on to ju just transition and looking at how should Europe's raw materials agenda deliver new jobs in industrial re regions. So join us tomorrow at one o'clock for the last in our series. And again, a final very warm thank you to all of our speakers and you, our audience. Thank you very much and goodbye.